something you knew that it was the Lord's will and you started it and you you worked on it a while and worked on it a while and worked on it a while and then all of a sudden it started getting a little frustrating you'd have your uh, a few steps forward and a few steps back and and uh, you get to a milestones in it and you're excited and and you, isn't it interesting how Satan just loves to throw all the different kind of curveballs at us and and how sometimes the world gets involved and 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 it's difficult because um, they act like they want to be our friend when we know though that apart from Christ they're they're condemned and and we have a responsibility to them and where do we draw the lines on how far we go and all those kind of things you know Christians wrestle with that don't you how, how far can I go and what should I say what should I do tonight I'd like to just take a look at a, f- a few things that might be helpful and I want to do it through the story of Ezra there was a great thing that was started I, I mentioned it this morning and I talked about the fi- fact that uh, Cyrus the Great had sent them back uh, the king of Persia and said anybody that wanted to go back and approximately about 40,000 went back in, in, in two or three different uh, trips back um, but in the process they all kind of settled outside of Jerusalem there were some who settled inside and everything but The first thing God wanted established was the temple. And and God made sure that Cyrus had said, make sure that they build the temple. So Cyrus the Great had given orders for that to take place. And so when the Israelites got back, believe it or not, it took them a few years just to get the things together uh, to rebuild the temple and everything like that. But it was a good thing. Uh, They were uh, doing what God had called them to do. This was prognosticated by Jeremiah. It was told about in Isaiah. And so now they're coming back and going to fulfill the things God wants done. Can you think in your mind for just a minute all the things that we know God wants us to do? Think about that for just a minute. All the things that he wants us to do. And, and of course, as a pastor, man, I can think of all sorts of things, but I know that you can as well. What are some things God wants you and I to do? Well, in the course of this, this is what the plan was for the people in Ezra's day. And they were supposed to go back and build the temple. So we see that a wonderful thing takes place. And in Ezra chapter 3, we find the completion of the foundation. They built the altar when they first got there. They sacrificed to God. But then they basically dedicated the foundation. This is not the, the temple itself. It was just the foundation on which it was to be built. And so we pick up the reading at Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the direction of King David of Israel. They sang, praising and giving thanks to God, saying, For he is good. For his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Now, what a great and glorious day that must have been. There's three things that I love. They completed the foundation. Then they sang praises and gave thanks to God. And they shouted as the people were being led. The people shouted about the greatness of God. And they praised God for what he had accomplished in rebuilding this. You've got to remember that David wanted to build the temple. But God said, I can't have a man with blood on his hands build the temple. And so it was passed on to Solomon to build the temple. And what a glorious thing. You can find the story of that in, in several places, uh, especially in Chronicles, though. You'll find the, 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 the original temple, Solomon's temple. But here we find it, in, and they're rebuilding that foundation. They're putting it back together because God had said, I want this to come back together. God had a purpose for Jerusalem, as we talked about this morning, and he had, it was important, he had a purpose for his people to do the work that he set before them. What a glorious day it must have been. But it doesn't take long for distractions to come in, and and that's where I want to spend just a little bit of time tonight in the message, to look at the distractions that first came in. If you'll take a look in chapter 4, verse 1, you'll find a very interesting thing The enemies come and they say, let us help. Let us help. Why would would our enemies want to come to help? 
It's interesting because there's a lot of people out in the world that want to force the issues of the world and say, church, you need to accept these things and want to force the issues into the church. And Christians, oftentimes, we remain silent. Tonight, I hope that I share with you some things that would cause you to say, wait a minute, I understand just a little bit better why they would do that. I know just a little bit better why. But let's take a look at the passage in Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of uh, of father's household and said to them, let us build with you. You know, it's, it's a perplexing question for us. Why does a lost world want to get into the things of God? Have you ever wondered that? Why, why would they care? Why, why don't they just say, just go on and do whatever you're going to do? Why would they want to be involved in that? In our world today, we have this spirit out there that says, why can't we all just get along? It reminds me of that song, why can't we be friends? And you know, the, the thing about it is, the things of this world, if we're friends with that, we're against God. And the world wants to, at every turn, seem to want to push those things into the church. I had a conversation with someone uh, during these these last uh, Raising Highly Capable Kids. and, And one of the interesting things about it was I said, you know, in some of the things, the world is trying to push that onto the church and say, you have to allow the world to tell you how to operate as a Christian. And it's interesting, we ought not to go out and tell the world how to operate, but the world ought not to come into the church and tell us how to operate. But it doesn't work that way. Have you noticed that? In the course of all of this, I want to just share with you some things. I'm not trying to get into a bunch of psycho babble or anything like that. But they say, why can't we all just get along? They also give reasoning when they say this. They're enemies. But we're seeking the same thing. How many times have you heard people say, we're all looking to get to heaven? Well, can we agree that there's only one way to get to heaven? And that's through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. So we're all not just seeking many different ways to get there, Oprah. We are, and we know that there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. They say to them, at the, in the second part, as they approach Zerubbabel, and, and say, let us build with you, for we like you. Seek your God, and we have been sacrificing to him since the day of es, um, Eshar Hadron, Hadron, Hadon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. In other words, we've been here. Notice it's the king of Assyria that brought them there. It isn't the Babylonian king. It wasn't the Persian king. If you've heard me speak about Assyria, they were the big, mighty power before Babylon came on the scene. They were the ones that took the northern ten tribes, the northern kingdom, Israel, and took them and they basically routed them and then they put them all over, a diaspora kind of put them all over into different places. And what Assyria would do is they would put... Uh, so many, a third of the people here, a third of the people here, and a third of the people here. Then they'd conquer the next group. They'd put a third of them here. They'd put a third of them here and a third of them here. And they would do that because what would happen is usually the God systems in all of these would be different. And so he didn't have to worry about them rising up under any type of religious uh, understanding because they wouldn't agree with one another. And because they didn't agree with one another, the king could sit very comfortably and know that there wouldn't be any uprisings because the people would not agree religiously and about a God. And so they wouldn't rise up and have any type of God to follow. And so what they're saying is we were brought here by the king of Assyria. We were brought here and we've been kind of getting along with your gods. You need to get along with our gods. Does that remind you of anything today? We have a melting pot in the United States and we have people coming from all over the world with all different types of religion and religious beliefs and all type of gods and everything like that. And why can't we all just get along? So these people were saying, well, we weren't here because of Babylon and Persia. We were here even before because we were displaced. We were displaced from where we We're from. Let us work with you. But when they, when we, when we come to this point in the study, I want to stop for just a minute. Why do people do that? We know that these were displaced. We know that they had other gods. We know that they were enemies. The scripture tells us that. 
But I want to take a look, if I could, real quickly, just why do people want to be around the things of God? Why do they want to join in where God is working? First of all, we can say, well, Satan is trying to thwart some things, but I think there's some basic human nature things that I'd like to just speak to you about tonight. First of all, why do we have enemies that want to work with us? They're enemies. They're against what we do. Why would they want to come in? Because they have different gods. A lot of times we can see that they want to come in because they're craving knowledge and truth. Maybe you're saying, what? Let me give you an example. When a child is young and they ask a question and you answer them, what do they usually do? They ask another question. Have you ever been in that endless cycle of questions that a child asks? Okay, well, if that's that, then why is this? And then you finally come to a point where you're like, leave me alone, kid. You bother me. Well, the reality of it is there is a desire to know. In fact, victims of crime and those families that have lost loved ones in a heinous way where their, their loved one was murdered or whatever, it's interesting because when you do any analysis on that, you will find that even though one question is answered about why, they have a hundred more questions that come and they're never satisfied. It's interesting how that works. But we have a desire to know. We have a desire to know and we want to keep knowing and, and the best way we can do that is through science. You may not know about the Scopes trial, but it happened way, way back. Uh, and it was dealing with creationism versus evolution. And believe it or not, it was, a, it was a terrible thing, but uh, there was a lot of arguing and fighting over these things, but science said, we now know. And we know today that it's speculation and hypothesis, which is an educated guess, but it doesn't mean that that's the truth, and creation is still what we believe as Christians because God's Word tells us that He spoke and it was created. But, but science comes in and says, no, 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 we have, we can answer those questions. We can give you even more. But you know, the more things they uncover, the more questions there are. Isn't that interesting? You see, the world wants answers to the things that, uh, to, the, to the questions they have about God and about all these things. And the best thing to do is hang around with people who know about God and then thwart them as they try and give answers. And you know, the final answer for a Christian about knowledge and truth is a word called faith. I don't know everything. But the world will say, I can't accept that faith answer. I want more. And so they like to stay close to us until we come to that point where we say it's by faith. I accept the things that God has said and I can't explain everything to you. But what I can tell you is by faith, I believe that God is who He says He is. And can do all that he says he can do. Believe it or not, to the world, that is not an answer they like to hear. This group had come and basically they were saying, we know enough about your God. And we want to just stay close to it because we want to put our God system against yours. In other words, bounce our knowledge off your knowledge and we want to be close to you. You know, there's an old adage that says, keep your friends close and your enemies even closer. This is part of what was going on here. It's interesting because even in uh, sitcoms of today, there's people like Cliff Clavin. If you've ever watched Cheers, he knows everything about everything. If you ask a question, he's got the answer to it. And you're sitting there and you know it's the stupidest answer you've ever heard of, but he gives it anyway. We have a desire to know. We see it in our children. We see it in ourselves. Our knowledge is not complete and that's why questions will always be around. This is why Christians, when you have questions that you can't answer, that are bigger than you, when is the Lord coming back? Is He coming back? And we accept that by faith because He promised. The, the world has a hard time with that. They have a difficult time with that. 
It is our awareness that there's more to be known at the very moment when something is known. It drives us to more questions. And the world is that way because they still see, see well, the world from a, a sinful perspective. They keep asking the questions. Have you ever been in that, that conversation with somebody and they just keep asking questions? And you keep coming back to the same answers and pretty soon what happens is the fellowship breaks down because they're tired of getting the same answer because once you boil it down for a Christian, there are many things that we can answer. But when you boil it down for a Christian, it comes to the fact that Jesus Christ is the only way and we accept him by faith because of God's grace. And that still leaves questions in the mind of the world. Because they can't believe that he's God. And that it could be so simple. But it is. The only way, or the only one who can answer the questions is God. And the questions that the world would ask are from a sinful nature. And they can only be answered by faith. This is why it was accounted unto Abraham as righteousness. The second thing that I would say is a craving for perfect love. Now, again, why are these enemies? We're talking about them being enemies, but yet wanting to stay close to us. They're still looking for answers, and the world's not giving them a better answer, but they're still wrestling with the faith issues. And I realize that when we look at this, and we look at the people of old, this is the same pattern, though, because we see the same pattern in our world today. Why can't we just get along? We're all seeking the same truth. Should we all love one another? And that's where I'd like to go next. The craving that they have to be loved. They have a desire for a perfect and unconditional love. I have to tell you, there's only one person on this, on this earth that ever walked on this earth that can give perfect and unconditional love. Can anybody name him? And he walked as a human being, so he is the only one the only one. But yet the world seeks that. And they think they have the ability to be able to say, I can discover it for myself. I know some of you are husbands and wives and you love one another and that's wonderful and you say unconditional love and everything like that. But I got to tell you something, you're still human, are you not? And are there not times you're trying to look out for yourself and maybe you manipulate your, your spouse into something, but you're really looking out for yourself, but you tell, say you're looking out for them. Okay, come on, don't have to admit it. Oh, you already are. Don't look at me that way. Well, this desire can't be fulfilled, can't be fully accomplished within the fabric of humanity because of sin. Nobody can be perfect. We were all born in sin. By one man, sin entered in. And guess what? Death came on us all because of sin. And so when we look at this, there's no way that you can say, I know somebody who just unconditionally loves me. But that's what the world looks for. They want that. And the reality of it is, we can't do that perfectly because we're not God. We're not Jesus Christ. But we're supposed to be moving closer and closer and closer to Him in that relationship and understanding more and more what it means and what it looks like. But none of us will attain that perfection because there was only one who could and that was Jesus. Expecting perfect love from another human being is impossible apart from Jesus Christ. I won't ask for a show of hands or anything else and I'm not looking for any fights to get started over this but if you're in a relationship with anyone and you love them have you ever been disappointed in them? Have you ever seen them not love you unconditionally? Have you been at a place where you didn't operate in that unconditional love either? You know, when I look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the interesting thing about it is I can't do that. I can strive for it. It's like the Ten Commandments. I can strive for it, but I can't accomplish everything that it says every moment of every day because if I could, that's perfect love. I keep striving for it, and this is why Jesus said, love one another. Love one another, but how do we love one another the way it says in 1 Corinthians? That's not just for married couples, that's for us as well. Care more about the others than I do myself. 
The world desires that, and this is why it's so important for Christians to demonstrate that and strive for it, because the world won't find it out there. That's why there's so many broken relationships. That's why there's so many things wrong in the relationships in our world today. Our desire for perfect and unconditional love can only be met by the perfect love of God. He's the only one that can define and show us what it means to unconditionally love. Because he demonstrated it. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Unconditional. It wasn't uh, that God commended his love toward us. And he wanted to be sure there was going to be some returns. And people would accept Jesus Christ. It doesn't say that. Even while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Unconditional. There was no guarantee that anybody would accept it. But God was willing to demonstrate it to us because he loved us so much. The world will never understand an unconditional love apart from Jesus Christ. And this is why every time they go out into a relationship and they say, Oh, I found the perfect person. How many times have you heard somebody say, Oh, I found the perfect person. And then six months later, that is the worst person I've ever met in my life. We are horrible at determining what a perfect relationship looks like. Can I I get an amen? But I tell you what, if you look to the one who shows us exactly what a perfect relationship is like, you'll understand unconditional love. And you'll understand why his love is the only love. God has implanted in each of us a conscious desire for a perfect love that only God can fulfill. Well, they probably also were having in their processes of thinking about things they thought that they had a right to go into this stuff because they'd just been hanging around but they also wanted justice and goodness they wanted equity fairness that's not fair how many times have you heard that from a child how many times have you said that that's not right that's not fair you know, the world is a very unfair place. I, I think it's terrible that we treat, teach our children that, that the world is going to be fair. Uh, I, I know we should strive for it, and as Christians we should live toward fairness and, and goodness and righteousness. I get that. But I have to tell you, that's not the world's agenda. That's not the things that the world grabs hold of. These people were craving for a perfect justice. We want to be treated the same way. We want to continue on what we were doing beforehand. We feel the same outrage toward groups, social structures, and even God when we perceive that he, that we've not been treated fairly. How many times, even as Christians, we say, God, why are you doing this to me? In other words, you're saying to God, that's not fair. Given that a desire for perfect justice and goodness cannot be found in an imperfect world, you're not going to find pure justice. You're not going to find perfect righteousness apart from Jesus Christ in this world. This is one of the reasons why when people talk about don't judge me, they're operating off of an imperfect world, an imperfect understanding They say, don't judge me about things that are wrong, whether morally, whether biblically, ethically, whatever the case may be. And when we say something about it, depending on where they are in morals or ethics or according to God's word, depending on where they are, they declare you've been judging them. And the fact is that injustice is going to be here and people are going to believe that they're always right about certain things. Judge Judy thinks she's right about every case that she presides over. But the reality of it is there's only one righteous judge. And this is one of the reasons why as Christians I can say the world's already condemned. Now that doesn't mean give up on them. That means that they're needing to be rescued out of that condemnation. And the only way that they're going to be rescued out of it is through Jesus Christ. And we as Christians have a responsibility to tell them about Jesus Christ. See how it works? They will seek justice and they'll cry that it's not fair. But the reality of it is we realize that the only one who is just is God, and we trust Him in that. The last thing that I would share with you in these reasons, and then we'll continue on and pick it back up, in Ezra, there's a craving to be at perfect harmony and peace. You know, this time of the year, everybody wants to 
jingle bells and everybody wants to be happy and everything. But you know, the, the more, the older I get, the more unhappiness I see during this period of time. Did you know that during Christmas and Thanksgiving and some of the holidays, there's a very high suicide rate? What does that tell you about happiness? A lot of people are unhappy. And a lot of people think that I've got to do this, 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 this. And if I do these things, then I'll be happy. It's interesting. They crave love, joy, unity, holiness, peace. But they all have a different definition of what that means. Some would say, the more I have, the happier I'll be. But... We know as Christians that that's not true. The Bible teaches us to be content whether we have much or we have little. Paul said, I've been hungry and I've been well fed. But what I've learned is to be content. See, the world doesn't like to be content. The world says there's got to be something more. The craving of the world is there's more, there's more, there's more, there's more. And this is why Christians need to be very careful about what we do and how we present the message of Christ and how we present ourselves. We must be very, very careful because we don't need to digress to the understanding of the world. But we need to point them to a better way. And that better way and that better harmony and peace comes through Jesus Christ. They said that peace is among men. That's right. But you see, when man tries to make it their own way, then they had to be a desire to be right in the middle of the things of God because they want to feel like they've got some kind of relationship. It reminds me, if you've ever seen the movie of The Mummy, when The Mummy comes across this little squirrely-voiced little character, and, and he's got all of these trinkets hanging around his neck. And he holds up one that's this religion, and he holds up one that's this religion, and one that finally holds up the Star of David. And The Mummy recognizes that's the Jews. And that's what a lot of people want to do. And that's what the people of that day were doing. And that's why they were the enemy of God. Because they wanted to just put all these things together. We've been worshiping with you. We want to do these things. We want to continue on. But what was continuing on all during this time? From the time that the Babylonians came in. And they came through the third time and destroyed everything. There had been about 150, 140 years. That had been, that had been just whatever they could come up with. And, and figure out they didn't have the priests. They didn't have the Levites. They didn't have all of those people who could lead in it. So it had basically digressed and disintegrated down into what they understood of it. And they didn't want it to change because it fit in all their God stuff and everything like that. And so now that it was coming back in its purest form and it was coming back and Israel was going to start doing what God had prescribed for them to do that set them apart from the rest of the world, they said, we don't want you to do that. We want to be involved in it for love reasons, for for uh, knowledge reasons, for uh, 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 justice and goodness we want all of these things just to continue on but the things of God cannot continue in the vacuum of the world and when it came time to separate themselves apart when it came to the worship of their God they were unyielding in this and that's where we pick up the story the leaders respond back in verse 3 but Zerubbabel and just uh, um, Jeshua, the rest of the heads of the fathers, households of Israel, said to them, You have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. They were taking back some of the ground that had been released by the, the, the Israelites and the people of Jerusalem and the people of Judah. Some of those rights that had been released because they had gone into captivity and all of the stuff that had been going on had been just kind of a hodgepodge of worship and they wanted to be included in it. And Israel said, no, the things of our God are the things of our God. You want to bring in all of these other things and we can't have that. Well, it's interesting because these create more distractions. First of all, you want people that want to say, why can't we just be friends and get along? But other distractions came in from the world. I want you to remember these that I've just shared with you because I have to tell you, people are seeking knowledge they want to know. They're seeking love because they desire it. They're seeking justice and goodness. They're also seeking harmony and peace. 
All of these things the world is seeking and God has said, I'm the only answer to that. And let me tell you, within you, because of Jesus Christ, that treasure has been implanted. You can understand all of the questions that the world would have, but you could see where they would be unsatisfied. And while they want to say, no, I want to be a part of this, they cannot be a part of it because they're apart from Jesus Christ. And when that takes place and the world can't do what it wants to do, then they start putting up more roadblocks. In fact, if you look at verse 4 and 5, then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Did you catch the three things they did? They tried to discourage them. How many times have you heard somebody out in the world say, why do you believe all that garbage? Do you realize that's them trying to discourage you away from the things of God? You know, when people try to discourage you, one of the things that the Bible tells us, you know what lifts us up? Of course, the Holy Spirit living within us, but also the Word that resides in our heart. Because we know the world is going to be discouraging. Why? Because they're judged. They're, they're condemned already. And they want you to look as bad as they look. They want you, they want to discourage you to stop you from doing this that they can have no part in. You see, nobody can come into the family of God and go to heaven and spend eternity with Him without coming through the blood of Jesus Christ. And they create their own ways to do that. So when they can't get in and we say, no, we're going to hold to the things of our God. We're going to hold to the things that his word teaches. Then they get scourged and they want to say evil against us. The church is stupid. Religion is dumb. And you know what? Some of that we've proven quite well to them. But let me tell you, the things of God are not foolish or dumb. And the things of God are what ought to be in our hearts. And when the world wants to discourage us, our hearts ought to be encouraged because we have a relationship with God. You know, when discouraging things come, it takes me a moment sometimes to think of how God is working in all that's going on. Sometimes I think, ah. Oh. And then God says, do you not remember when I did this? Do you not remember? And my mind goes back and I'm reminded of all of those things that God has done. And then I start putting on a different face that says, wait a minute, God's going to take care of this. The problem with it is sometimes I'm very transparent about it. When you come and tell me something and, and it just sinks my heart, I just go, what? And it takes me a minute to just absorb that in and realize God's still in charge of all of this. And he reminds me of that, does he not, to you as well? I'm in charge of this. And because of that, I have to rest and you have to rest in faith that God will see you through. So when the people come and they discourage you, and try and get you to walk away from the things of God, you and I need to understand that we're doing and we have more than they will ever have because we understand what it is to be perfectly loved. We understand what it is to have the knowledge and to have someone we can trust with what we don't know. Also, that there's justice. Not what the world sees, but perfect justice. It's interesting because we can have that peace and that harmony. And tomorrow night I'm going to talk about that peace and where it comes into our life and that joy. There is a, when I was going to school, um, there was, uh, my dad would say, son, if you want to date that young lady, that's fine. But you have to, if she goes to a different church, you have to go and sit down and take notes of the sermons. You know how hard that is when you're wanting to be a cool guy with your arm around your girlfriend and have to take notes on the sermon. Or In Catholicism, it's called a homily. And you have to take notes on it. And then you have to go and make an appointment with the priest or the religious leader and, and ask them some questions and, and be versed enough to, to be able to ask them and not just sound like a, 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 an idiot. And my dad even had me, uh, while we lived in Alice, he, he, he let me go to catechism. Uh, I'd never been baptized, so there wasn't a day I was ever going to get confirmed. But the Catholics thought it was just awesome that the Baptist preacher's son was going to a catechism class. You may be going, heresy of heresies. Well, I'll tell you something. There was something that came out of that that, that has always been in my heart and in my mind 
because it's a true thing. It's one of, I can't remember which catechism it was, but it says this, the desire for God is written in the human heart because man is created by God and for God, and God never ceases to draw man to himself. Only in God will he find the truth and happiness he never stops searching for. I don't care how you slice it or dice it, but that's about as biblical as it gets. They said, we're going to discourage you. But our satisfaction comes in knowing Him. Our confidence comes in knowing Him. Our peace, our strength, our joy, everything comes in knowing Him. And you know what? Don't let people steal away your joy because they want to be discouraging because they don't understand these things. Every time you see that happening, you can smile within yourself and say they just don't understand. But you can also weep a little bit because you need to be the one that's sharing that love with them and showing them what it looks like. We can also see that they tried to frighten them, scare them. I don't know why, but uh, they're, they're putting uh, Friday the 13th. They're doing it all, all uh, uh, New Year's Eve night. I'm sitting there going, how stupid is that? Why would I want to enter into a new year with great fear? Isn't there enough things out there to fear? But God says, hey, what do we have to fear? He holds it all in his hand. He's God. And so what do I have to fear? And, and they tried to frighten them and keep them from building. Third thing that they did was they hired counsel against them. You know what? There's nothing scarier than hearing these words. I've retained a lawyer and I'm going to sue you. That's what they did. And then finally, when they couldn't get them discouraged, they couldn't frighten them, and even the council went against them. It's interesting, and, and believe it or not, yes, I'm almost finished with this message, but I want you to see something. The next thing that the world likes to do is make false claims against you. Because it says in Ezra chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, this is what they wrote to the king. Okay? And, and I hope you paid attention, because there's some things I hope you catch. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem. They are rebuilding the rebellious and evil city. I love drama. And are finishing the wall and repairing the foundations. Wait a minute. Ezra was there before Nehemiah got there. The foundation's only been laid, and when Nehemiah got there, the temple was already built. So they're lying. The wall wasn't even being worked on at the point. Nehemiah wasn't there. Isn't that interesting how that works? He goes on to say that they're finishing the wall and repairing the foundation. Well, they were right about the foundation, but the wall, no, no. They were trying to convince others to take action because in verse 13, Now let it be known to the king that if that city is rebuilt and the walls are finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and it will damage the revenue of the king. i, I got to tell you, anytime you, you tell a leader, you're going to lose money on this deal. Oh, no, we're not going to lose any money on this deal. And they prolonged this from the reign of Cyrus all the way to Darius. So a new king had come out, and so they, they hammer him with all this. Do you understand what these people are going to do to you? Isn't it funny how always, there's always somebody out there that says, Oh, it's going to get terrible. Things are going to be so bad. Well, then they, they wrap it all. It's kind of like a piece of sausage wrapped up with a piece of bacon. Then they wrap it up and make it sound like, oh man, we're only doing this for your benefit. In verse 14 now, because we are in the service of the palace. And it is not fitting for us to see the king dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king. I always love tattletales. Especially when they lie. I, I, I don't love them because I have an affection for them, but because they think they can get away with it. And so it says in verse 15, so that a search may be made. They're saying, search it to make sure that these people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, Darius was a new king, so hey, do you think he was going to take this little bitty uh, skirmish that was going on and, and everything like that and, and stop and take the time to go back and look through the records? No, in fact, that happens a couple of kings later. But Darius isn't going to do that, and they knew that. So they were looking at the opportune time to make these things happen. Don't believe for a moment that Satan doesn't work in ways that are very coordinated. 
And then they go a little bit further and they give a little bit of truth in what they say because in verse 15, the second part of it, and you will discover in the record book and learn that the city is a rebellious city and damaging to kings and provinces and that they have incited revolt within its past days. Therefore, that city was laid waste. And they're talking about Babylon. When Babylon came through and destroyed them. And they're saying, go back and look. These people were really bad people. And then, King wants you to know you lose. Because in verse 16, we inform the king that if that city is rebuilt and the walls finished, as a result, you will have no possession in the province beyond the river. You're going to lose it all, king. Do you know what the king did? He sent back a decree and said, stop the work. Stop the work. And I close with this because up to this point, they're right on task. They're right on target, and I hope the things I've shared with you would cause you to say, I can see that in our world, and I can see why they would want to do it, and it would cause you to say, is there a better way that I can communicate with a lost world because these are some of the things they're looking for. But what's interesting to me is when they come to this place, I don't want to leave you on a downer, but this is the interesting part. When the king said, stop, the people didn't even bat an eye. They stopped. Foundation was laid, altar was built, they were willing to just stop. The first time the king said, stop, if the record had been searched, Darius would have found the words of Cyrus saying, rebuild it and don't do anything to let it stop. But they didn't pursue it any further and for 15 years, they did nothing until Haggai comes and he says, what are you doing? Remember I talked about they built their, their houses and stuff, they didn't build them in Jerusalem. They build them in the outlying areas. They built them out there. And Haggai says, let's get back in here and get this done. And they do to the glory of God. I hope this helps tonight. I realize you're saying this is the the 23rd of December and tomorrow's the 24th. And he went the full time on preaching the message and and everything. I got to tell you something. The word of God is great. Whether it's the 23rd, the 24th or the 5th, uh, 25th of, of December. The Word of God can always teach us some things. So as you go out in the world, if you have a better understanding of what you're dealing with out there and know that this, this, is, this still happens today, maybe it'll give you a confidence to say, I need to study my Bible more. Give you a confidence to say, I need to trust you more. To give you the confidence to say, Lord, let me have faith in the things that you've already taught me so that I can be a better witness to the world. Our joy ought to be accompanied by us telling people about Jesus Christ. Where there's no joy, there's no reason to tell anybody anything. But when we have joy in the things of God, there's every reason to tell them about Him. Would you stand with me? Father, thank you for the opportunity.